Welcome, uh, my name is Simon, Simon Hondedal. Um I'm here uh, invited by Side Effects to talk a little bit about some of the work we do at Panoply. Panoply is our studio, we're, we're remote, uh, we're fully remote and we have people spread out over Europe um, connecting to a data center and that's been a godsend um, since, you know, obviously when COVID hit it was pretty handy as a lot of people probably know, you know, that happened. Um, and it's been really handy for us in order to not have to share files, send files over having it all centralized like we used to when we had an office, but now just fully remote. So I'm going to start today. We're going to be talking about uh, our curiosity series, which is our kind of art projects that we kind of do that just anything that is like between projects where we want to just explore some concept or idea. Um, so we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to start by playing this little reel. Hopefully the sound comes through. Um, which is just a collection dump tap of, of all the stuff that we've been doing so far. a couple of things there that you probably haven't seen yet we're going to be talking about some of them so curiosity is, as i said it's meant to be like a short project that is done in, within a week usually it's by one person sometimes we have them kind of working along uh, you know together um but it's just a way of like get, getting it out of the system basically and exploring different things the first one i'm going to talk about today is vor and i'm apologizing it's going to get a little bit um a little bit technical at some points there so if you take take out what you want from it but um the idea behind this one was quite simple um it's taking a shape like a Veroni structure that is so fundamentally 3d and cg related and then kind of bringing it back into something that is a little bit more tactile and a little bit more um you know real realistic it's kind of the meeting point between cg and and reality and and building a system that kind of generates these unique clusters uh, that then animate um, and it's all about you know um, probability and how how likely a certain piece is going to be generated in a certain way and designing with that probability in order to create a a good image that has uh, variation in detail calmness color uh, in everything you know that makes up a, a beautiful image we also decided to make it kind of to further emphasize the the point of it being like inspired by furniture or architectural forms letting the light kind of scattered within the volume of this it kind of helps to bring it united into a bigger shape a superstructure if you will so this is just some stills from it i don't know if you've seen it but we're gonna be going through a little bit how how this is built um and it's going to get messy and technical and it's probably going to be really tough to see in the back. <laughs> so I do apologize. Uh, so I've done some screen recordings here just to explain. So this is Houdini for those of you who are not too familiar with it. Um, entirely node-based workflow. We're starting off with a simple cube. This is where it gets a bit dry. <laughs> and scattering a bunch of points on it. Um, from these points, we're then um, fracturing the surface, which is the most basic thing. You've all done this. You get it. It's not complicated, but that's what happens. Um, but we're not interested in this, this box necessarily. So what we're doing is we're going through and essentially converting each one to a packed prim, which is basically an instance. And then we're also splitting out anything that is connecting with the part of that group of the original cube. So that way we can delete anything that sits, that touches it basically, allowing us to create this kind of internal structure that has a lot more interesting shapes and it's exactly what we needed for this um so this is what's basically everything is going to be built built upon and you know you can change the seeds up there and it will generate a completely different we're going to go through that in a minute so this is basically what <laughs> 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 so 
So yeah, so this is what we're gonna starting off with and that's what we're gonna end up with. So a completely generative model that has all the kind of uh, balance visually that was designed into it. It's kind of like being a gardener where you're like cutting your bush and letting it grow in a certain way. Um, so proceduralism can be very noisy and messy, but it can also feel intentful if you kind of do it right and balance balance the colors and details uh, with percentages. So this whole big thing here is basically a loop that runs through each one of those original pieces and models it up. So we're just going to rough run through it quickly. So don't 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 worry about what it, exactly every node is doing because it's not important. This is more of a concept. So the first thing we wanted to do is get rid of this CG nature of this where it's like completely round like sharp and we just want to round off the corners. And it's so simple. Each little task here is so simple really. We're just resampling the curve of each um, edge and then blurring it, averaging the neighbors and then deleting all the inset points to kind of remove everything along the edges that we don't need. So that describes the shape. Uh, that's our new shape that's going to be go in to create the kind of wire frame um, that we use later on. And then we're shrinking in the surface of each polygon and just randomly deleting a percentage based on the seed number. So this just becomes the panels, the, the solid panels, or like the input of that. And I apologize for my messy network. It's, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> uh, so then we're taking the, the, the iteration uh, number and including the iteration number of these uh, different polygons to kind of determine which ones of these gets cut and split. So you can see this cut just happened there and that's gonna and be treated as one of the kind of colored panels. Um, and then for the remaining ones, they go further in and get split again uh, based on a probability. So in this case, this particular piece are going to be kind of modeled up slightly differently. So we're shrinking it in a little bit and then we have a subnet. And for those of you who don't know, subnet is basically where you take a whole messy network and you just make it into one node so you can dive into it and have even more mess to look at. <laughs> so this is great. So here we're starting with our original uh, polygon and we're basically just capturing the longest edge and generating a matrix. Everyone knows what a matrix is, right? To explain it. So a matrix basically allows us to transform our geometry. So by capturing the longest edge, I can then move it into the origin and line it with an axis. You guys know when you're modeling stuff, you want to be doing it preferably in the origin. So the idea is the same, even though we're working procedurally. So we're moving it to the origin and we are then processing it further. And all of these tasks here are really basic. We're just shrinking, extruding, booling. You know, we're splitting it, we're shrinking it in and bullying it against self to create these two different paths, splitting them up again um, and here again. We're taking that and we're dividing it, basically just cutting it up. And every other piece gets uh, grouped and extruded out and then merged in with the edge and, you know, applying UVs and laying them out. Um, so it's pretty basic. Each little node does a very simple operation, but then combined with this proceduralism, it, it makes it really powerful. And then once we have that model at the origin, we just use the same matrix we generated up here from the edge and just apply it back. So we're just inverting the, the transformation again to, to, to put it back where it was. So now we can dive up, go from that to that basically. Now we can dive up here and look at the panels combined. So the, these are now the, all the, come on, talk to myself in the past, uh, all of this, um, are now combined together with the different groups that then will be used in the material assignment. And if we look at the rest of the piece, we're going to go through some of these other parts. See, we now have the framework and also an internal kind of spider web of mess to kind of balance up the calmness of the outside bits. It's all about that visual balance and hierarchy of shapes and forms. Um, so for the web, it's even more of a mess. We're basically just taking the main shape, shrinking it down, and connecting a load of wires, uh, basically. I'm gonna pause here because I need to take a breath. Uh, and then we're kind of, you see here where we have slight different colors. So the ones where are black are basically just close to original shapes. So it's just a distance threshold. And we're gonna use that as a way of pinning these points to kind of maintain some sort of structure in the shape. Um, 
So this goes down to a feedback loop down here, which is basically just running the same nodes over and over again for a set number of points, um, in this case 12 times. And all it's doing is it's, it's basically just averaging, blurring based on the color. So if it's a white point, it will kind of allow the point to move. If it's black, it's pinned. And we're, all we're doing is looking at nearby points. So we're using a point cloud open Poisson filter to read out the position of nearby points and average our position based on the color information. So the white points move more. Fuse, resample, iterate. And that's creating that minimal surface that we use as the web. Um, the next step is we're using that together with another grid that is just scattered within. And this basically just gets pinned. It, it, we move all the unshared edges towards the, the network that we generate. And then we're just averaging neighbors within. And it creates this really minimal surface that is suspended uh, within. We then generate a UV on this. And then in the render, we're using this to render with an alpha to kind of break up the wires and give it a little bit of localized structure within the chaos. So now we've basically gone through that entire network very quickly. And it doesn't matter exactly how every part is done because you're going to be doing something different anyway, probably with this. Um, but it allows us to model all of this after just modeling one of them. And we didn't really model it. We kind of just set up the system to do it for us. And that's the beauty of working uh, procedurally. So here we can see where we started, where we ended up. Now we just need to animate this. So simple-ish. <laughs> Went back to the original <laughs> shape. And I, I'm, I should, I should pre-emphasize that we're, we're using a lot of HDAs. HDAs are basically collections of nodes that you kind of collect up into a pre-made tool. Um, so some of these things like the capturing the matrix, that's something I had to figure out once how to build and then we can reuse it over and over again. So first time it's a bit slow, but then you kind of speed up your process over time. So in this case, we're just taking all the pack prims and connecting them with wires. And then we're running another HDA here that I built, it was pretty much the first thing I ever built in Houdini. It's just an infectious system that spreads wires uh, from a, a seed point. And this gives us our like a skeleton, if you will, for this kind of rig. And then I use another tool here, which is called Fold Curves, which is another HDA, um, which basically just allows us to transparent all these wires together. So you, you have like a hierarchy structure that kind of like a joint system or um, kin effects sort of thing. But it's not using that, it's just using um, math. And then you can apply this transformation to a pack prim. So now we have this, it's a little bit stiff still. I've kind of added this little curve here to kind of break up the, the motion so it's a little bit more jittery because I was after something a bit different. But it wasn't enough, so I decided to do a little bit of trickery here where I unpacked the points and then reprojected them into nearby points or pieces that have a higher uh, hierarchy value. So they basically just get pinned down and it created this really sketchy motion that I quite like, where it was like, felt like popcorn or a time lapse or something. And I kind of liked the imperfection of how they just snapped into place so sorry um so yeah that that was what was going on there we're just literally unpacking it and then reprojecting it onto nearby surfaces that then has to see it i need to talk so fast because there's so much going on uh, so yeah then we're just transferring those transforms over to the high res uh, mesh essentially we essentially built the entire system there um so now we're trans and that's literally just transferring over the prim intrinsic attributes, as well as the position. Um, and we're unpacking it and splitting out the wires, which is the internal stuff for rendering. And we're also taking out, so that's a lot of geo there. That's fine nowadays. Uh, got memory on the GPUs and that. So, so that's the entire network that build up that entire thing. So, oh, sorry. This is, uh, is it moving? No, it's moving. So this is a demo of that kind of curve folding thing that, that's used um, in order to animate it. So this is just that rig on its own and I've overlaid it with a kind of set of packed prints. It's just some random shapes, but this shows how it kind of parents to those things. It's a simple rig really, um, just for demonstration purposes. So there you go, very handy. And that's the result of the tree we looked at. I literally just play blasted it out. Um, looks like some normals are flipped.
oops. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> and all of these little uh, suspended fabric pieces are then rendered with as a little web. You can see it here, just to br give a little bit of order to the chaos. So this is the. I don't know if I wanted to look, and I was, didn't know I was going to be there live, so I apologize. Um, so I just did the same edit in light and dark, and then we worked with a sound designer to kind of just. Uh, Human Robot Soul is the guy we use for most of our audio. Really like that guy. So um, another one, um, Intermission, this is a new one that we really released yesterday, I think, uh, which was a. I don't know if you guys have heard of Solaris Lops. Yeah, so th this was an a, a test of Karma, really, in Solaris, and trying to do something with that, because we haven't really explored that yet. So I um, wanted to see how easy is it to t take a, sh a simple setup and, you know, alter, work, set up the materials and everything with Material X and Karma. Uh, this was rendered with Karma XPU as well, which is in beta at the moment. And then being able to just freeze the frame and then change the lighting, you know, move the lights around, alter materials and everything, and set up all of these renders from just one particular hip file, which was, you know, before you had takes and stuff like that, but it's a bit of a mess. There, there's ways to, around it, but it's just really nice to be able to branch out and do your tweaks on the individual cameras and lights uh, in one, one simple place. So, yeah, these are some of the, some of the, frames that were generating from that but and it was really really a, a great process karma xpu has also come a long way it's really really fast um, and we're looking forward to using it more in the future hopefully as our primary engine because uh, it looks great i think um so this is this was also an animation and and it's a simple ish transformation we're going to go through i didn't actually rig or animate this um my business partner Mark did that but uh, we wanted to try this kind of USD workflow see if he could just give me a USD file and I could then texture light it and composite it from there um, we learned a few things it wasn't completely smooth but we, we, we get there and um, so but he's that being said I didn't build this but he showed me how it was built so I'm gonna still be running through it so you, you still get to see under the curtain what what happened there but it's completely seamless looping thing here. So yeah. Uh, with that being said, we're back into Houdini, back into this madness uh, of a software. Um, and, and this is what we will be creating. And you can see this is just a few steps, but again, it being procedural, you can just change the number and it will create more slices. And the thing to note here is that the UVs are kind of uh, continuous. So if you look at the numbers, it's like six, eight, 10, 12, 16. And that's really, really important, obviously, for it to line up. Uh, so this is what we're going to look at now. Hope you're ready. <laughs> um, it's, it looks worse than it is. It's not, really. Uh, so we're starting with a cube, extruding it, and then setting up some groups for the individual faces. And this is just so we can manipulate the UVs of the different islands. Uh, so looking at this in the UV island, you just see it's literally just transforming the different tiles so that when it, they, they kind of meet up later on, it will line up perfectly. Uh, we're also creating a separate UV for the top and bottom because we needed that later. Uh, <laughs> it's not that important. Um, we're then kind of transforming it. So 
we're essentially working, if you those who haven't figured it out, we're working on a, a quarter of it, uh, of, of this kind of cube cylinder transformation. And we're then just beveling one edge, and that kind of gives us most of the transition. You see how well the UVs are handled through the, uh, the bevel there as well. So that's kind of where the idea started from. Uh, we're also setting up a hinge group for where it's pivoting, and then we do the same thing again. So now all we have to make sure is that the UVs line up, both on the inside and outside of the shape, and you know, do it again. You know, it's four times here, so that's why it looks like a lot, but it's the same thing. So once the line up, we, we create the entire cylinder like that. And then this kind of feedback loop down here is what's doing the slicing and the offsetting of time. So the first thing for that is we're creating a line that sits from the top to the bottom of the shape. And we're resampling, basically introducing more points within it, as you can see there. So instead of just being two points, it now has 30. Um, and then we're converting that to individual lines and then recording that line number as an ID attribute. And this is kind of important because my intuition would say like, why don't you just run a for loop for each primitive? But from my testing and from our understanding is that we can't use the time shift in the feedback loop if we do that. You can. You can. Yeah, there is a way. I'm there is a way. <laughs> Apparently there is. We, our workaround was to just like set the number of primitives and then doing it for each number kind of thing. Uh, yeah, there is a way. So don't, don't take my word for it, but apparently there is a way. But we, that's what we did. It's a simple workaround. Um, so we're basically just looking at the convert line up there and checking number of primitives. Okay, this is how many iterations we're gonna have. And the first thing we do here is just blasting out everything but the current primitive that we're looking at. So, so there we have one primitive we're looking at, at the loop now. Uh, within the loop, basically, so this was going to happen to all of them, basically. We're creating a cube, massive, and then just matching its Y size and centering it. So using a match size, we can kind of shrink it down to sit exactly where that line was in Y. We're also fitting in that which we just built. Um, and then we're splitting out the four different components. You see here, it's a very clear structure, here, same as before. Um, and then we're booling it against this cube that we just created up here. Uh, and that gives us a perfect kind of quarter of this slice, except for we don't have UVs on it. So we're just taking the same cube that we fed in, big animation, matching that size, and then taking out the sides from that, and then boom, UVs. Um, and then we're adding a little bit of a random offset on these UV tiles uh, within there, using the iteration number of the loop. Fusing it back together, we've created a kind of quarter of a slice uh, with UVs that now follow the transformation. We did it again four times, there we go. And we have the entire segment. Um, we're also splitting out the hinge attribute, which is basically these edges which is hinging around. And these also get match sized down to the same height. And it's then using an attribute that was created earlier, um, allowing us to kind of create a sweep from that. You'll see here, matching the size of that. I'm explaining that there visually, but I've already said it. Um, so yeah, we're creating these little cylinders that then it's gonna get booled against the rest. The Boolean in Houdini is incredible and very stable. So forget everything you think you know about Booleans if you haven't used it, because it's actually really stable. So that's it. And then we have a little time shift here that is using the iteration as a way of offsetting each slice in time. So those things combined, if we uncheck single pass, it will run this entire thing now in, in, par in not in parallel, but one after the other, <laughs> in technically, but with different offsets. Do you care about uh, motion blur, velocities? In this case, we were just trying to figure out <laughs> uh, Solaris, but yeah, that, that was a thing that we didn't actually do in this and that's that's a failure on our part i suppose um because uh yeah that, that would be obviously doable you would have have to figure out how how to translate that transform that movement i'm just sh changing the seed uh, the sort sorting of this because we were using a per proximity to point which is the origin to kind of n number these primitives and that's why it's starting transition there and if we change the number we get more or less slices 
have gone. So that's 60 slices. I think we rendered in the renders we had 100 slices, uh, but you could easily just type in whatever number. <laughs> um, and again, we're just offsetting the time using iteration and a multiplier. So that's it, basically. The other side, it's the same thing. It's just for the other, other transformation. So we don't have to go through it twice. Don't worry. It's the same thing uh, with some minor tweaks you know, here and there. So that gives us this. That then gets sent into Solaris and then rendered with Karma. So that's kind of an overview of that again. Uh, I think we've seen it, but you get it. Sometimes those, a lot of simple things combined just creates nice things, you know, so. Um, yeah, there's a cut point. And you see here, the top here doesn't line up and that's why we created that other UV attribute for the top and bottom. So we used another UV set for those faces. Um, anyway, there it is. Um, how are we doing on time? 30 minutes ago. Okay. So the realization, this is a new project that we're working on. It's uh, gonna come out in the next few weeks probably. We're still, this is more of a tease than anything, but it, it's all about, the, the concept came from just driving everything with a camera move. So you have like a camera that starts at 90 degrees, uh, pulls back, and as soon as it tips over the, the zero plane, the world starts to go weird. <laughs> so it's kind of like this kind of fever dream concept. Um, these are some of the scenes that we're currently working on, one of them being a school corridor. Um, we're like, as soon as we tip over the 90 degree car, the kind of locker starts multiplying, the floor, you know, extrudes down, the roof is moving, everything is getting weird. And the idea is that we have this portal that we go through um, in each scene so that the next scene can pick up from, you know, and start first like normal and then become weirder and weirder as we go through it. So that's one of the scenes. Um, here's another one, uh, which is our take on rush hour, but with instruments, uh, this is kind of fun. This, we just allow us to do the stupid ideas that would be no reason to do otherwise. So, yeah, it's just looping into itself right now, but the idea is that it would be able to loop into the other scenes if we wanted to, or, or leave us its own loop as well. This would have been great scenes to set up in Solaris, but unfortunately we started this years ago and we just got busy and didn't have time to finish it. So, And then we have a third one. This doesn't have the loop in it. This is, uh, what do you call it? In a garden, but an interior garden. I don't, I always forget the word for it in English, but um, where the kind of lake is kind of starting to grow this weird alien structures <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> um, the pond, I should say. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the concepts behind it in terms of technically. Um, so first off, we're going to talk about the lockers and how they work. So are you ready for another no tree? <laughs> I hope so. Uh, so yeah, so it's a simple ish uh, transformation uh, it's just part of that school scene as i said first thing we're doing is we're taking a locker and creating a bounty box and then copying it out so this is just like a simple box for each one basically that sits within the shape and then it's a very manual process of selecting polygons and extruding them so this is not very procedural um but we just wanted to control in this case and again, I should say, uh, caveat, that this is a network that I didn't build completely, but I did help out on some parts. Um, so I hopefully I don't butcher it, but yeah, so that's the animation happening there on the polygons. Um, and then we're just setting up some groups. So for the different facing normals. So basically upwards facing goes one way, the sides goes another way. And here's like the tricky part. So, the thing is about the extrude and stuff like that, you think it's always going to give you the same vertex order. It doesn't. It's a lot of, sometimes they're shuffled in an undesirable way for what you're trying to do. In our case, we needed to know which parts were facing up on these polygons. Um, so we just built a little matrix to kind of, we'll talk about it. Oh shit, sorry. I need to go back uh, where we were. 
Sorry about that. Uh, we've been through this. Ah, okay, anyway, so here we are. We're back. So this loop goes through each polygon. Um, and the first thing we're doing is we're storing the prim points. So they are the points that are relate to any given polygon. Um, so this is running through each polygon, should be said first. So we're only dealing with four points in this case. Um, so th then we're running through each one of those primitives and, and iterating through uh, the um, different points and, and finding out if they're at the top or bottom. That's the first step. So a lot of people would do this in VIX. I'm weird, so I do everything in VOPS pretty much exclusively. Uh, so I apologize. Um, so basically we're just bringing in this array and we're iterating through all the points. Um, we're also bringing in a constant, uh, which is set to minus one. That's just like a way of indicating that it has not been met the conditions yet for this, this uh, loop. Uh, so that's being fed through. It comes back in for each iteration it runs. All we're doing is we're taking out the position of each point that we find and comparing it to the relative point bounding box, which is basically just a zero to one value on each axis. If it's at the bottom, meaning it's under 0.5 really, but we have another number there, it doesn't matter. We know that we found the point that we're after. And as long as that's true, and we haven't met this condition previously in the loop, that's still equal minus one. If those two are true, we're passing through the point number. Otherwise we're passing minus one until it finds the condition. Next time it's true, this will be true, but that won't be. So we're only passing through the first one that we find. And that then goes out here to the next step where we're getting the numbers, the neighbors of that point and also the position of that point. And we're comparing now which one of the neighbors of this point that we found sits above us. So we're doing just a comparison on the Y coordinate. So once we found that, again, we're passing it on. And from there, we're just building a matrix using a subtraction. So you just subtract, you have two points subtract one from the other, you get a vector. If you normalize that and then combine with the normal of the surface, you can generate a matrix just using cross products. So that's what's happening here. That matrix now allows us to move this polygon down to the origin. We know which way is up now. So that's the idea. So we kind of inverting this matrix. Um, so you get it down to the origin again, like that. We did that previously in the other project as well, so you, can, you should be familiar with the concept. We're then storing this rest position, normalizing it, not technically necessary, but again, that's what's the part that I didn't build. And then we're creating a new grid, which we know the, the point order. And we're just literally moving it onto the rest position of the other one, because now they're overlapping, we can sample the, the, the rest position of the other one, and then just transfer it. And then we just revert the matrix again. We moved it back, but now we know the point order. So that's what this loop is doing. It's also compiled. A lot of, a lot of people poo-poo poo uh, soft loops, but they can be pretty fast. And, and in, in a lot of cases, um, I try to pick my battles, you know. Sometimes it's just easier to build it in a soft loop rather than writing something in VIX and doing it really cleverly. And if it doesn't need to run fast, if you're only running it once, it doesn't matter. So we just do whatever is fast, but in this, place it's compiled as well so it's pretty fast it can multi-thread oops sorry and again i'm jumping so yeah uh it should be we're going back to it now sorry so yeah i'll skip that watch this uh, okay okay so the next thing we're doing is we're taking the last frame of this animation scattering points within it and applying color to these points this then gets transferred over to the primitives and with a bit of a color grading thing here, we can shift them around, change the colors. And this will then later be used in shading for the different lockers. Um, we are, okay, what else are we doing? We're also creating, uh, taking the last frame and then referencing the distance that the point has traveled at any given frame to generate a mask that we'll use to be opening and closing the locker. So you see here when it lights up, basically indicates that we want to open the locker. Um, so then we're doing another thing again, very similar concept, always moving it to the origin and applying the transform. So we're transferring the matrix and inverting it. Um, 
again. Now we're using that animation attribute we just previewed up here to apply a transformation to them to make them op open. So if we look at this loop now, it's adding that transformation to these polygons. And if we bypass this last inversion or ap matrix application, you'll see them all at the origin and they're all kind of offset with that attribute. Again, all driven by the distance that they travel. So it's all just propagating through. And then we take our, our final, our lock, locker part, isolate there, so we want to apply to this, normalizing it. Again, not necessary, but there you go. Um, and then applying it onto those polygons and bringing in the other sides and tops and bottoms and stuff. And that's it. That's it for that transformation. So that gets us to there. And then obviously there are other parts of this scene and it's still being worked on, but that's how that effect is done. Kind of fun, maybe. <coughs> Are we doing on time? Are we running out of time? That's a shame because this one is... All right. So, yeah, we're going to talk about whenever you need to run s a bunch of sims. How much time do we have? Do we have a... There's lunch afterwards, so... Okay. Yeah, five minutes-ish. Okay, <laughs> good luck. Um, so, yeah. Okay, <laughs> we started with a grid. We're scattering a bunch of particles on it. And from these particles, we're storing the nearby point value. Um, using this, we can then generate these different islands. I'm using a noise as well to break up the edge. This is just a prototype to kind of explain a concept here, but it's not exactly the same thing as in the garden, but I just wanted to show how you can possibly structure and scale your scenes. So in this case, we're isolating one iteration of this loop, and we're setting up a little random setup that we don't really need to go into detail about because it's just something I did the day before yesterday, and I didn't have time for it, but I did it anyway, because <laughs> I wanted to. Um, creating a bit of a fall off from the edge, um, resampling it, and then we're running a feedback loop here to kind of move and remesh this surface uh, over time. I've copied these nodes into solver so we can see it over time, so you can much quicker get a grasp of what it's actually doing. So yeah, it's just lifting up, using some noises to mask it, and also that fall off that we created. Uh, and it's also doing a bit of diffusion, basically just looking at nearby points and pushing away from them, but with a bias towards the up vector. So it's just like, yeah. And this is just showing that it's the same nodes inside of the solver as here. Uh, it's just to show you. So that's the mask again, transferring the distance to that edge. Um, yeah, and here's the noises that are combined, averaged. And that's creating our mask multiplied against the color, which was that noise uh, fall off that we saw before. That one. Uh, and then it's just moving a vector, pointing it up. So just this is the first step. The next step is the diffusion. Here it's pretty basic as well. We're just subtracting our own position against the nearby points. And then using a dot product with an up vector, basically allowing us to make sure it doesn't ever go down, so it has a bias towards up. We leave in the X and C coordinates just as they are, scaling it by the color information we had before and a, a separate parameter. Anyway, I wanna move on. Uh, sorry about this, I'm going fast. Remeshing each frame uh, or each iteration and smoothing it out and then recreating the pin group because we're rebuilding mesh every frame. So after 120 frames, we're left with this. Cool. Next time, I've just used an old asset that just creates conversion to VDB and then projects it along a noise pattern and then using curvature to kind of scale it. Doesn't matter. This is what it does. <laughs> swan donkey, coral swan donkey. That's it. Um, doesn't matter. Move on. We don't have time for this. Come on. Talking to myself in the past again. Um, so yeah, so then we're taking that, we're creating an ambient occlusion. Um, there's other nodes for this. This was just an old asset and I'm just a creature of habit, so I keep using my old stuff. Uh, storing our neighbors and then we're doing the same thing as we did before pretty much, a diffusion, but this time we're not resampling, we're just smoothing out the neighbors. Uh, so we're just averaging our neighbors for each step. And we're using it against the bias, first masked by the occlusion, but also up vectors. It kind of makes it feel like it's kind of growing up or like it's reaching for the sun or whatever methodology you want to use on it. 
That being said, let's move on. That's cool. I also want to get this done now. Um, subdividing it, we sort of see what it's doing. Um, and then I'm probably reducing this to kind of make it a bit sensible. Uh, creating a new AO with this new information and combining the two uh, values. And then running another reduce to just create a really low res one. And I'm smoothing out, applying UVs to, and then transferring them over just so we have something for shading. And that's essentially the network uh, that we're going to be now running on all those other islands. So it was over 260 of them. Um, we also have another network here connecting these wires. Hacky, hacky stuff. You could do this much better, but I don't know if we have time for this, honestly. <laughs> but anyway, we're just using the AEO to isolate some areas and uh, scattering points shrinking them down so we can make sure we don't intersect and then shoot them out again to kind of intersect with the shape and make sure we don't have any overlaps, removing any ones that doesn't find a primitive here. Um, and then we're just intersecting it downwards with a mesh. So that way we kind of get this kind of stuff or we smooth it out. And that gives us the kind of gravity looking thing. Um, and then we're just checking for intersections against the mesh and deleting all the ones that are intersecting. So that way, job done. Um, after that, um, we run this through a top network. So what I've done is I've taken this, this node graph and the one that we built here and just copied it into a node graph where we're referencing the different islands upstream and generating a work item for each one. So we have 230 work items. It's a total of almost 700 uh, tasks cooks that would have broken any machine on the planet if you try to run them all as one big island. But doing it this way, uh, it allows you to kind of prototype something on small scale and then run it across a network or your machine. Sometimes there's a lot of nodes that might be slower than others. So you, your CPU man might be idling at times. So it could be good to run them in parallel on your same machine and gain a lot of speed improvements. So using that, Anyway, yeah, those sh just showing that it's the same nose. Once that's cached, you basically end up with a lot of geometry. And it doesn't look pretty because this is, <laughs> you know, just on a grid, it's a prototype, uh, you know, just to show that it works. And it's something I did two days ago and I didn't have time for it. So deal with it. These are loops that just reading in all these caches. So again, 230 caches plus another 230 caches is just merged in together. Uh, I rendered it as well, brought it into LOPS. It doesn't look good, it doesn't hold up because the subdivisions are too low really for holding up at this scale, but you can see the curves there. And this is one of the islands on their own and a few stupid renders that don't really deserve to be rendered to be honest, but yeah. Anyway, that's it for me. Um, sorry about uh, the rush at the end there. We've seen this, we've seen this, it's fine. So yeah, that's it. Sorry guys, that was a rough thing. Thank you. So I should put the URL, but if you want to find us, it's panoply.co.uk. Um, shoot us an email if you have any inquiries. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. Maybe not, but if anyone has questions. Uh, lunch is served downstairs, but feel free to stay behind. There's there's a huge line downstairs for lunch anyway. Of so course. Yeah. Okay. So that's it, I guess. Uh, do you, like when you teach people this, but they also stuff, by the way. It's, Thank you. It's, it's really cool. I want to ask if you, because, you know, when you teach people these kind of things, because you also, you know, do a lot of these kind of stuff, but in a different like, VFX context. Mm -hmm. Like when you teach people these kind of things and, you know, you show them how the whole system works, but then uh, this is not actually the thought process. Like that's not how you build it. You you go through lots of different ideas and, you know, some things stick and some things don't. Uh, so, how, like, have you, have you taught people these kind of things and, you know, how did you do? Mm, it's not too far from how it's built, to be fair. I mean, uh, I can kind of imagine the possibility. You, it's, it's kind of like a source gathering first. You start with your original shape and then you're trying to think, what data can I generate from this? And you kind of get an intuition after a while, like what you can potentially do with it. So. Sometimes you start with a reference and you want to create something similar, you, you think 
what do I need to do this? And then you're already in that mindset. Like in the example of the Vore one, it's a pretty basic idea. Just pa build furniture out of Veroni shapes, put a light strip in it potentially. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question because it's not really an answer, but. That was meaning if you get taught other people these kind of things. Uh, not much, yeah. no. I mean, I've just been brought up this way from working at Mavericks Machine for a few years and then run always been kind of researching and messing around with weird stuff so yeah uh i don't know i don't know other, any other way to be honest uh so yeah sorry <laughs> not the best answer so how much is your sort of the balance between just sort of knowing what you do maybe it's sort of related to that but also sort of just trying things out oh it's a lot of like i just think of us as designers and the design process is testing stuff right which is to your point as well. Um, it's hugely important, obviously, to explore and test because sometimes a system might look really cool and interesting in your head, but then when you actually do it, it just creates noise because there's a visual hierarchy that needs to be there. You need to know what's the most important thing that needs to take front and center and what, need, what deserves to be subdivided and detailed up further. And that's, that's you know, an, a never ending struggle of like, when is too much, when is it not enough? You know, it's, that's the hardest part. Getting the, getting the balance of shapes and forms and motion and everything fit together, that's. What's the balance between sort of like actual sort of once you know what to do compared to sort of just sort of R&D and playing, playing around? Mm. It's usually, diff it's not enough time ever for, for the R&D, of course not, but uh, Ah, oh, it's so hard to say. It varies, but I would say we try to, we try to make up as much time as possible for it because we know that everything is going to branch from it. Yeah. But a lot of times, you you need to police yourself as well because you can be going down a rabbit hole with something that you're really interested in, but it actually doesn't have any relevance to what you end up creating. And it's being self-policing yourself at all times, knowing what is the most important thing I need to convey visually before committing the time to researching that. And that way it gives you that time you otherwise would have spent on something you don't need to do back to where you need it. And so the research can be done more like optimized basically. So, but we try to do uh, more than half research and the rest is production, but yeah, ideally. Any other questions? If not, I'll be around obviously. So, all right, thank you guys. Thank you.